pain. Ten days later, Harper and Joe Ledoux arrived at Sixty Mile, and daylight, still a trifle weak, but strong enough to obey the hunch that had come to him, traded a third interest in his Stewart town site for a third interest in theirs on the Klondike. They had faith in the upper country, and Harper left downstream with a raft load of supplies to start a small post at the mouth of the Klondike. Why don't you tackle Indian River daylight, Harper advised at parting. There's a whole slather of creeks and draws draining in up there, and somewhere gold just crying to be found. That's my hunch. There's a big strike coming, and Indian River ain't going to be a million miles away. And the place is swarming with moose, Joe Ledoux added. Bob Henderson's up there somewhere. Been there three years now, swearing something big is going to happen. Living off in straight moose and prospecting around like a crazy man. Daylight decided to go to Indian River a flutter, as he expressed it, but Elijah could not be persuaded into accompanying him. Elijah's soul had been seared by famine, and he was obsessed by fear of repeating the experience. I just can't bear to separate from grub, he explained. I know it's downright foolishness, but I just can't help it. It's all I can do to tear myself away from the table when I know I'm full to bustin' and ain't got storage for another bite. I'm going back to Circle to camp by a cache until I get cured. Daylight lingered a few days longer, gathering strength and arranging his meager outfit. He planned to go in light, carrying a pack of seventy-five pounds, and making his five dogs pack as well, Indian fashion, loading them with thirty pounds each. Depending on the report of Ledoux, he intended to follow Bob Henderson's example and live practically on straight meat. When Jack Kearns' scow, laden with a sawmill from Lake Linderman, tied up at Sixty Mile, Daylight bundled his outfit and dogs on board and turned his town site application over to Elijah to be filed, and the same day was landed at the mouth of Indian River. Forty miles up the river, at what had been described to him as Quartz Creek, he came upon signs of Bob Henderson's work, and also at Australia Creek, thirty miles farther on. The weeks came and went, but daylight never encountered the other man. However, he found moose plentiful, and he and his dogs prospered on the meat diet. He found pay that was no more than wages on a dozen surface bars, and from the generous spread of flour gold in the muck and gravel of a score of creeks, he was more confident than ever that coarse gold in quantity was waiting to be unearthed. Often he turned his eye to the northward ridge of hills and pondered if the gold came from them. In the end, he ascended Dominion Creek to its head, crossed the divide, and came down on the tributary to the Klondike that was later to be called Hunker Creek. While on the divide, he kept the big dome on his right. He would have come down on the gold bottom, so named by Bob Henderson, whom he would have found at work on it, taking out the first pay gold ever panned on the Klondike. Instead, Daylight continued down Hunker to the Klondike and on to the summer fishing camp of the Indians on the Yukon. Here for a day he camped with Carmack, a squaw man, and his Indian brother-in-law, Skookum Jim, bought a boat, and with his dogs on board, drifted down the Yukon to Forty Mile. August was drawing to a close. The days were growing shorter and winter was coming on. Still with unbound faith in his hunch that a strike was coming in the upper country, his plan was to get together a party of four or five, and, if that was impossible, 
at least a partner, and to pull back up the river before the freeze-up to do winter prospecting. But the men at Forty Mile were without faith. The diggings to the westward were good enough for them. Then it was that Carmack, his brother-in-law Skookum Jim, and Cultus Charlie, another Indian, arrived in a canoe at Forty Mile, went straight to the gold commissioner, and recorded three claims and a discovery claim on Bonanza Creek. After that, in the sourdough saloon that night, they exhibited coarse gold to the skeptical crowd. Men grinned and shook their heads. They had seen the motions of the gold strike gone through before. This was too patently a scheme of Harper's and Joe Ledoux's, trying to entice prospecting in the vicinity of their town site and trading post. And who was Carmack, a squaw man? And who ever heard of a squaw man striking anything? And what was Bonanza Creek, merely a moose pasture, entering the Klondike just above its mouth, and known to old-timers as Rabbit Creek? Now if Daylight or Bob Henderson had recorded claims and shown coarse gold, they'd have known there was something in it. But Carmack, the squaw man, and Skookum Jim, and Cultus Charlie, no, no, that was asking too much. Daylight, too, was skeptical, and this despite his faith in the upper country. Had he not only a few days before seen Carmack loafing with his Indians and with never a thought of prospecting? But at eleven that night, sitting on the edge of his bunk and unlacing his moccasins, a thought came to him. He put on his coat and hat and went back to the sourdough. Carmack was still there, flashing his coarse gold in the eyes of an unbelieving generation. Daylight ranged alongside of him and emptied Carmack's sack into a blower. This he studied for a long time. Then from his own sack into another blower, he emptied several ounces of Circle City and Forty Mile Gold. Again for a long time he studied and compared. Finally, he pocketed his own gold, returned Carmack's, and held up his hand for silence. "'Boys, I want to tell you all something,' he said. "'She sure come, that upriver strike. "'And I'll tell you all clear and forcible, this is it. "'There ain't never been gold like that in a blower in this country before. "'It's new gold. It's got more silver in it. "'You all can see it by the color.' Carmack sure made a strike. Who all's got faith to come along with me? There were no volunteers. Instead, laughter and jeers went up. Maybe you got a townside up there, someone suggested. I sure have, was the retort, and a third interest in Harper's and Ledoux's. And I can see my corner lot selling out for more than your hen scratching ever turned up on Birch Creek. That's all right, Daylight, one curly parson interposed soothingly. You've got a reputation, and we know you're dead sure on the square. But you're as likely as any to be mistook on a flim-flam game, such as these loafers is putting up. I ask you straight, when did Carmack do this here prospecting? You said yourself he was lying in camp, fishing salmon, along with his Siwash relations, and that was only the other day. And Daylight told the truth, Carmack interrupted excitedly, and I'm telling the truth, the gospel truth. I wasn't prospecting, had no idea of it. But when Daylight pulls out, the very same day, who drifts in downriver on a raft load of supplies, but Bob Henderson. He'd come out to Sixty Mile, planning to go back up Indian River and portage the grub across the divide between Quartz Creek and Gold Bottom. Where in the hell's Gold Bottom? Curly Parsons demanded. Over beyond Bonanza, that was Rabbit Creek, the squaw man went on. It's a draw of a big creek, 
that runs into the Klondike. That's the way I went up, but I come back by crossing the divide, keeping along the crest several miles, and dropping down into Bonanza. Come along with me, Carmack, and get staked, says Bob Henderson to me. I've hit it this time, on gold bottom. I've took out forty-five ounces already, and I went along. Skookum Jim and Cultus Charlie, too. And we all staked on gold bottom. I come back by Bonanza on the chance of finding a moose. Along down Bonanza we stopped and cooked grub. I went to sleep. And what does Skookum Jim do but try his hand at prospecting? He'd been watching Henderson, you see. He goes right slap up to the foot of a birch tree. First pan, fills it with dirt, washes out more'n a dollar coarse gold. Then he wakes me up, and I goes at it. I got two and a half the first lick. Then I named the creek Bonanza, stake discovery, and we come here and record it. He looked about him anxiously for signs of belief but found himself in a circle of incredulous faces, all save Daylight, who had studied his countenance while he told his story. "'How much is Harper and Ledoux giving you for manufacturing a stampede?' someone asked. "'They don't know nothing about it,' Carmack answered. "'I tell you it's the God Almighty's truth. I washed out three ounces in an hour.' "'And there's the gold,' Daylight said. I tell you all, boys, there ain't never been gold like that in the blower before. Look at the color of it. A trifle darker, Curly Parson said. Most likely Carmack's been carrying a couple of silver dollars along in the same sack. And what's more, if there's anything in it, why ain't Bob Henderson smoking along to record? He's up on gold bottom, Carmack explained. We made the strike coming back. A burst of laughter was his reward. Who'll all go partners with me and pull out in a polling boat tomorrow for this here bonanza? Daylight asked. No one volunteered. Then who'll take a job from me, cash wages in advance, to pole up a thousand pounds of grub? Curly Parsons and another, Pat Monahan, accepted and with his customary speed, Daylight paid them their wages in advance and arranged the purchase of the supplies, though he emptied his sack in doing so. He was leaving the sourdough when he suddenly turned back to the bar from the door. Got another hunch, was the query? I sure have, he answered. Flower's sure going to be worth what a man will pay for it this winter up on the Klondike. Who'll lend me some money? On the instant, a score of men who had declined to accompany him on the wild goose chase were crowding about him with proffered gold sacks. How much flour do you want? asked the Alaska Commercial Company's storekeeper. About two ton. The proffered gold sacks were not withdrawn, though their owners were guilty of an outrageous burst of merriment. "'What are you going to do with two tons?' the storekeeper demanded. "'Son,' Daylight made reply, "'you ain't been in this country long enough to know all its curves. "'I'm going to start a sauerkraut factory and combined dandruff remedy.' "'He borrowed money right and left, "'engaging and paying six other men to bring up the flour "'in half as many more polling boats. "'Again his sack was empty.' and he was heavily in debt. Curly Parsons bowed his head on the bar with a gesture of despair. What gets me, he moaned, is what you're going to do with it all. I'll tell you all in simple A, B, C, and one, two, three. Daylight held up one finger and began checking off. Hunch number one. A big strike coming in upper country. Hunch number two. Carmack's made it. Hunch number three. Ain't no hunch at all. It's a cinch. If one and two is right, then flour just has to go sky high. 
if I'm riding hunches one and two, I just got to ride this cinch, which is number three. If I'm right, flour will balance gold on the scales this winter. I'll tell you all, boys, when you got a hunch, play it for all it's worth. What's luck good for if you all ain't to ride it? And when you all ride it, ride like hell. I've been in this country just waiting for the right hunch to come along. And here she is. Well, I'm going to play her. That's all. Good night, y'all. Good night. End of Part 1 Chapter 9